Chapter Eleven of Baron Trigot's Vengeance by Emile Gaboriau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleven. Having almost reached the goal, Chupin slackened his pace. He approached the shop very cautiously and peered inside, deeming it prudent to reconnoitre a little before he went in. And certainly there was nothing to prevent a prolonged scrutiny. The night was very dark; the key deserted no one was to be seen not a sound broke the stillness the darkness the surroundings and the silence were sinister enough to make even chupin shudder though he was usually as thoroughly at home in the loneliest and most dangerous byways of paris as an honest man of the middle classes would be in the different apartments of his modest household the scoundrel's wife must have less than a hundred thousand a year if she takes up her abode here thought chupin and in fact nothing could be more repulsive than the tenement in which madame paul had installed herself it was but one story high and built of clay and it had fallen to ruin to such an extent that it had been found necessary to prop it up with timber and to nail some old boards over the yawning fissures in the walls if i lived here i certainly shouldn't feel quite at ease on a windy day continued chupin sotto voce the shop itself was of a fair size but most wretched in its appointments and disgustingly dirty the floor was covered with that black and glutinous coal dust which forms the soil of the quai de la seine an auctioneer would have sold the entire stock and fixtures for a few shillings four stone jars and a couple of pairs of scales a few odd tumblers filled with pipes and packs of cigarettes some wine glasses and three or four labelled bottles five or six boxes of cigars and as many packages of musty tobacco constituted the entire stock in trade as chupin compared this vile den with the viscount's luxurious abode his blood fairly boiled in his veins he ought to be shot for this if for nothing else he muttered through his set teeth to let his wife die of starvation here for it was m de corral's wife who kept this shop chupin who had seen her years before recognized her now as she sat behind her counter although she was cruelly changed that's her he murmured that's certainly mademoiselle flavie he had used her maiden name in speaking of her poor woman she was undoubtedly still young but sorrow regret and privations days spent in hard work to earn a miserable subsistence and nights spent in weeping had made her old haggard and wrinkled before her time of her once remarkable beauty naught remained but her hair which was still magnificent though it was in wild disorder and looked as if it had not been touched by a comb for weeks and her big black eyes which gleamed with the phosphorescent and destructive brilliancy of fever everything about her person bespoke terrible reverses born without dignity even if she had struggled at first it was easy to see that she struggled no longer her attire her torn and soiled silk dress and her dirty cap revealed thorough indolence and that morbid indifference which at times follows great misfortunes with weak natures such is life thought chupin philosophically here's a girl who was brought up like a queen and allowed to have her own way in everything if any one had predicted this in those days how she would have sneered i can see her now as she looked that day when i met her driving her grey ponies if people didn't clear the road it was so much the worse for them in those times paris was like some great shop where she could select whatever she chose she said i want this and she got it she saw a handsome young fellow and wanted him for her husband her father who could refuse her nothing consented and now behold the result he had lingered longer at the window than he had meant to perhaps because he could see that the young woman was talking with some person in a back room the door of which stood open chupin tried to find out who this person was but he did not succeed and he was about to go in when suddenly he saw madame paul rise from her seat and say a few words with an air of displeasure and this time her eyes instead of turning to the open door were fixed on a part of the shop directly opposite her is there someone there as well then chupin wondered he changed his post of observation and by standing on tiptoe he succeeded in distinguishing a puny little boy some three or four years old and clad in rags who was playing with the remnants of a toy horse the sight of this child increased chupin's indignation so there's a child he growled the rascal not only deserts his wife but he leaves his child to starve 
we may as well make a note of that and when we settle up our accounts he shall pay dearly for his villainy with this threat he brusquely entered the shop what do you wish sir asked the woman nothing i bring you a letter madame a letter for me you must be mistaken excuse me aren't you madame paul yes then this is for you and he handed her the missive which florent had confided to his care madame paul took hold of it with some hesitation eyeing the messenger suspiciously meanwhile but on seeing the handwriting she uttered a cry of surprise and turning toward the open door she called monsieur mouchon monsieur mouchon it's from him it's from my husband from paul come come a bald-headed corpulent man who looked some fifty years of age now timidly emerged from the room behind the shop with a cap in his hand ah well my dear child he said in an oily voice what was i telling you just now everything comes to those who know how to wait however she had already broken the seal and she was now reading the letter eagerly clapping her hands with delight as she finished its perusal he consents she exclaimed he's frightened he begs me to wait a little look read but m mouchon could not read without his spectacles and he lost at least two minutes in searching his pockets before he found them and when they were adjusted the light was so dim that it took him at least three minutes more to decipher the missive chupin had spent this time in scrutinizing in appraising the man as it were what is this venerable gentleman doing here he thought he's a middle-class man that's evident from his linen he's married there's a wedding ring on his finger he has a daughter for the ends of his necktie are embroidered he lives in the neighbourhood for well dressed as he is he wears a cap but what was he doing there in that back room in the dark meanwhile m mouchon had finished reading the letter what did i tell you he said complacently yes you were right answered madame paul as she took up the letter and read it again with her eyes sparkling with joy and now what shall i do she asked wait shall i not no no exclaimed the elderly gentleman in evident dismay you must strike the iron while it's hot but he promises me to promise and to keep one's promises are two different things he wants a reply tell him but he stopped short calling her attention with a gesture to the messenger whose eyes were glittering with intense curiosity she understood so filling a glass with some liquor she placed it before chupin and offered him a cigar saying take a seat here's something to keep you from feeling impatient while you wait here thereupon she followed the old gentleman into the adjoining room and closed the door even if chupin had not possessed the precocious penetration he owed to his life of adventure the young woman and the old gentleman had said enough to enable him to form a correct estimate of the situation he was certain now that he knew the contents of the letter as perfectly as if he had read it m de corrès's anger and his order to make haste were both explained moreover chupin distinctly saw what connection there was between the letter to the baroness and the letter to madame paul he understood that one was the natural consequence of the other deserted by her husband madame paul had at last become weary of poverty and privations she had instituted a search for her husband and having found him she had written to him in this style i consent to abstain from interfering with you but only on conditions that you provide means of subsistence for me your lawfully wedded wife and for your child if you refuse i shall urge my claims and ruin you the scandal won't be of much use to me it's true but at least i shall no longer be obliged to endure the torture of knowing that you are surrounded by every luxury while i am dying of starvation yes she had evidently written that it might not be the precise text but no doubt it was the purport of her letter on receiving it corath had become alarmed he knew only too well that if his wife made herself known and revealed his past it would be all over with him but he had no money charming young men like the viscount de corath never have any money on hand so in this emergency the dashing young fellow had written to his wife imploring her to have patience and to the baroness entreating or rather commanding her to advance him a certain sum at once 
this was no doubt the case and yet there was one circumstance which puzzled chupin exceedingly in former years he had heard it asserted that mademoiselle flavie was the very personification of pride and that she adored her husband even to madness had this great love vanished had poverty and sorrow broken her spirit to such a degree that she was willing to stoop to such shameful concessions if she were acquainted with her husband's present life how did it happen that she did not prefer starvation or the almshouse and a pauper's grave to his assistance chupin could understand how in a moment of passion she might be driven to denounce her husband in the presence of his fashionable acquaintances how she might be impelled to ruin him so as to avenge herself but he could not possibly understand how she could consent to profit by the ignominy of the man she loved the plan isn't hers said chupin to himself after a moment's reflection it's probably the work of that stout old gentleman there was a means of verifying his suspicions for on returning into the adjoining room madame paul had not taken her son with her he was still sitting on the muddy floor of the shop playing with his dilapidated horse chupin called him come here my little fellow said he the child rose and timidly approached his eyes dilating with distrust and astonishment the poor boy's repulsive uncleanliness was a terrible charge against the mother did she no longer love her own offspring the untidiness of sorrow and poverty has its bounds a long time must have passed since the child's face and hands had been washed and his soiled clothes were literally falling to rags still he was a handsome little fellow and seemed fairly intelligent in spite of his bashfulness he was very light-haired and in features he was extremely like m de corath chupin took him on his knees and after looking to see if the door communicating with the inner room were securely closed he asked what's your name little chap paul do you know your father no doesn't your mother ever talk to you about him oh yes and what does she say that he's rich very rich and what else the child did not reply perhaps his mother had forbidden him to say anything on the subject perhaps that instinct which precedes intelligence just as the dawn precedes daylight warned him to be prudent with a stranger doesn't your papa ever come to see you insisted chupin never why mamma is very poor and wouldn't you like to go and see him i don't know but he'll come some day and take us away with him to a large house we shall be all right then and he will give us a deal of money and pretty dresses and i shall have plenty of toys satisfied on this point chupin pushed his investigations farther and do you know this old gentleman who is with your mamma in the other room oh yes that's mouchon and who's mouchon he's the gentleman who owns that beautiful garden at the corner of the rue riquet where there are such splendid grapes i'm going with him to get some does he often come to see you every evening he always has goodies in his pocket for mamma and me why does he sit in that back room without any light oh he says that the customers mustn't see him it would have been an abominable act to continue this examination and make this child the innocent accuser of his own mother chupin felt conscience smitten even now so he kissed the cleanest spot he could find on the boy's face and set him on the floor again saying go and play the child had revealed his mother's character with cruel precision what had she told him about his father that he was rich and that in case he returned he would give them plenty of money and fine clothes the woman's nature stood revealed in all its deformity chupin had good cause to feel proud of his discernment all his suppositions had been confirmed he had read mouchon's character at a glance he had recognized him as one of those wily evil-minded men who employ their leisure to the profit of their depravity one of those patient cold-blooded hypocrites who make poverty their purveyor and whose passion is prodigal only in advice so he's paying his court to madame paul thought chupin isn't it shameful the old villain he might at least give her enough to eat so far his preoccupation had made him forget his wine and his cigar he emptied the glass at a single draught 
but it proved far more difficult to light the cigar zounds this is a non-combustible he growled when i arrive at smoking ten sous cigars i shan't come here to buy them however with the help of several matches and a great deal of drawing he had almost succeeded when the door opened and madame paul reappeared with a letter in her hand she seemed greatly agitated her anxiety was unmistakable i can't decide she was saying to mouchon whose figure chupin could only dimly distinguish in the darkness no i can't if i send this letter i must forever renounce all hope of my husband's return whatever happens he will never forgive me he can't treat you worse than he does now at all events replied the old gentleman besides a gloved cat has never caught a mouse yet he'll hate me the man who wants his dog to love him beats it and besides when the wine is drawn one must drink it this singular logic seemed to decide her she handed the letter to chupin and drawing a franc from her pocket she offered it to him this is for your trouble she said he involuntarily held out his hand to take the money but quickly withdrew it exclaiming no thank you keep it i've been paid already and thereupon he left the shop chupin's mother his poor good mother as he called her would certainly have felt proud and delighted at her son's disinterestedness that very morning he had refused the ten francs a day that m fortunat had offered him and this evening he declined the twenty sous preferred him by madame paul this was apparently a trifle and yet in reality it was something marvellous unprecedented on the part of this poor lad who having neither trade nor profession was obliged to earn his daily bread through the medium of those chance opportunities which the lower classes of paris are continually seeking as he returned to the rue de flandre he muttered take twenty sous from that poor creature who hasn't had enough to satisfy her hunger for heaven knows how long that would be altogether unworthy of a man it is only just to say that money had never given him a feeling of satisfaction at all comparable with that which he now experienced he was impressed too with a sense of vastly increased importance on thinking that all the faculties and all the energy he had once employed in the service of evil were now consecrated to the service of good by becoming the instrument of pascal perailleur's salvation he would in some measure atone for the crime he had committed years before chupin's mind was so busily occupied with these thoughts that he reached the rue d'anjou and m de Carras's house almost before he was aware of it to his great surprise the concierge and his wife were not alone florent was there taking coffee with them the valet had divested himself of his borrowed finery and had donned his red waistcoat again he seemed to be in a savage humour and his anger was not at all strange under the circumstances there was but a step from m de Carat's house to the baroness's residence but fatalities may attend even a step the baroness on receiving the letter from her maid had sent a message to florent requesting him to wait as she desired to speak with him and she had been so inconsiderate as to keep him waiting for more than an hour so that he had missed his appointment with the charming ladies he had spoken of in his despair he had returned home to seek consolation in the society of his friend the concierge have you the answer he asked yes here it is replied chupin and florent had just slipped the letter into his pocket and was engaged in counting out the thirty sous which he had promised his messenger when the familiar cry open please was heard outside m de corath had returned he sprang to the ground as soon as the carriage entered the courtyard and on perceiving his servant he exclaimed have you executed my commissions they have been executed monsieur did you see the baroness she made me wait two hours to tell me that the viscount need not be worried in the least that she would certainly be able to comply with his request to-morrow m de corath seemed to breathe more freely and the other party he inquired gave me this for monsieur the viscount seized the missive with an eager hand tore it open read it at one glance and flew into such a paroxysm of passion that he quite forgot those around him and began to tear the letter and utter a string of oaths which would have astonished a cab-driver but suddenly realizing his imprudence he mastered his rage and exclaimed with a forced laugh ah these women 
they are enough to drive one mad and deeming this a sufficient explanation he added addressing florent come and undress me i must be up early to-morrow morning this remark was not lost upon chupé and at seven o'clock the next morning he mounted guard at m de corral's door all through the day he followed the viscount about first to the marquis de valorsaise then to the office of a business agent then to m wilkie's then in the afternoon to baroness trigot's and finally in the evening to the house of madame d'argelet here by making himself useful to the servants by his zeal in opening and shutting the doors of the carriages that left the house he succeeded in gathering some information concerning the frightful scene which had taken place between the mother and the son he perceived m wilkie leave the house with his clothes in disorder and subsequently he saw the viscount emerge he followed him first to the house of the marquis de valorsay and afterward to m wilkie's rooms where he remained till nearly daybreak thus when chupin presented himself in m fortuna's office at two o'clock on the tuesday afternoon he felt that he held every possible clue to the shameful intrigue which would ruin the viscount as soon as it was made public m fortuna knew that his agent was shrewd but he had not done justice to his abilities and it was indeed with something very like envy that he listened to chupin's clear and circumstantial report i have not been as successful he remarked when chupin's story was ended but he had not time to explain how or why for just as he was about to do so madame d'audelin appeared and announced that the young lady he expected was there let her come in exclaimed m fortuna eagerly let her come in mademoiselle marguerite had not been compelled to resort to any subterfuge to make her escape from madame de fondage's house the general had decamped early in the morning to try his horses and his carriages announcing moreover that he would breakfast at the club and as soon as her breakfast was concluded madame de fondage had hurried off to her dressmakers warning the household that she would not return before dinner-time a little while later madame leon had suddenly remembered that her noble relative would certainly be expecting a visit from her and so she dressed herself in haste and went off first to dr jodon's and thence to the marquis de valorsay's thus mademoiselle marguerite had been able to make her escape without attracting any one's attention and she would be able to remain away as many hours as she chose since the servants would not know how long she had been absent even if they saw her when she returned an empty cab was passing as she left the house so she hailed it and got in the step she was about to take cost her a terrible effort it was a difficult task for her a girl naturally so reserved to confide in a stranger and open to him her maidenly heart filled with love for pascal ferrailleur still she was much calmer than she had been on the previous evening when she called on the photographer for a facsimile of m de valorsay's letter several circumstances combined to reassure her m fortuna knew her already since he was the agent whom the count de chalus had employed to carry on the investigations which had resulted in her discovery at the foundling asylum a vague presentiment told her that this man was better acquainted with her past life than she was herself and that he could if he chose tell her her mother's name the name of the woman whom the count so dreaded and who had so pitilessly deserted her however her heart beat more quickly and she felt that she was turning pale when at madame d'audelet's invitation she at last entered m fortuna's private office she took in the room and its occupants with a single glance the handsome appointments of the office surprised her for she had expected to see a den the agent's polite manner and rather elegant appearance disconcerted her for she had expected to meet a coarse and illiterate bore and finally victor chupin who was standing twisting his cap near the fireplace attired in a blouse and a pair of ragged trousers fairly alarmed her still no sign of her agitation was perceptible on her countenance not a muscle of her beautiful proud face moved her glance remained clear and haughty and she exclaimed in a ringing voice i am the late count de chalus's ward mademoiselle marguerite you have received my letter i suppose m fortuna bowed with all the grace of manner he was wont to display in the circles where he went wife-hunting and with a somewhat pretentious gesture he advanced an armchair and asked his visitor to sit down your letter reached me mademoiselle he replied and i was expecting you flattered and honoured beyond expression by your confidence my door indeed was closed to any one but you 
marguerite took the preferred seat and there was a moment's silence m fortunat found it difficult to believe that this beautiful imposing young girl could be the poor little apprentice whom he had seen in the bookbindery years before clad in a coarse serge frock with dishevelled hair covered with scraps of paper in the meantime marguerite was regretting the necessity of confiding in this man for the more she looked at him the more she was convinced that he was not an honest straightforward person and she would infinitely have preferred a cynical scoundrel to this plausible and polite gentleman whom she strongly suspected of being a hypocrite she remained silent waiting for m fortunat to dismiss the young man in the blouse whose presence she could not explain and who stood in a sort of mute ecstasy staring at her with eyes expressive of the most intense surprise and the liveliest admiration but weary at last of this fruitless delay she exclaimed i have come monsieur to confer with you respecting certain matters which require the most profound secrecy chupin understood her for he blushed to the tips of his ears and started as if to leave the room but his employer detained him with a gesture remain victor he said kindly and turning to mademoiselle marguerite he added you have no indiscretion to fear from this worthy fellow mademoiselle he knows everything and he has already been actively at work and with the best result on your behalf i don't understand you sir replied the girl m fortunat smiled sweetly i have already taken your business in hand mademoiselle said he an hour after the receipt of your letter i began the campaign but i had not told you what you wished of me that's true but i allowed myself to suspect ah i fancied i might conclude that you wished the help of my experience and poor ability in clearing an innocent man who has been vilely slandered m pascal ferrailleur marguerite sprang to her feet at once agitated and alarmed how did you know this she exclaimed m fortunat had left his armchair and was now leaning against the mantel-shelf in what he considered a most becoming and awe-inspiring attitude with his thumb in the armhole of his waistcoat ah nothing could be more simple he answered in much the same tone as a conqueror might assume to explain his feat it is part of my profession to penetrate the intentions of persons who deign to honour me with their confidence so my surmises are correct at least you have not said the contrary she had said nothing when her first surprise was over she vainly endeavoured to find a plausible explanation of m fortunat's acquaintance with her affairs for she was not at all deceived by his pretended perspicacity meanwhile delighted by the supposed effect he had produced he recklessly continued reserve your amazement for what i am about to disclose for i have made several important discoveries it must have been your good angel who inspired you with the idea of coming to me you would have shuddered if you had realized the dangers that threatened you but now you have nothing to fear i am watching i am here and i hold in my hand all the threads of the abominable intrigue for ruining you for it is you your person and your fortune that are imperilled it was solely on your account that m ferrailleur was attacked and i can tell you the names of the scoundrels who ruined him the crime originated with the person who had the most powerful interest in the matter the marquis de valorsay his agent was a scoundrel who is generally known as the viscount de corral but chupin here can tell you his real name and his shameful past you preferred m ferrailleur hence it was necessary to put him out of the way m de chalus had promised your hand to the marquis de valorsay this marriage was valorsay's only resource the plank that might save the drowning man people fancy he is rich but he is ruined yes ruined completely irretrievably he was in such desperate straits that he had almost determined to blow his brains out before the hope of marrying you entered his mind ah thought chupin my employer is well under way this was indeed the case the name of valorsay was quite sufficient to set all m fortunat's bile in motion all thought of his ex-client irritated him beyond endurance unfortunately for him however his anger in the present instance had ruined his plans he had intended to take mademoiselle marguerite by surprise to work upon her imagination to make her talk without saying anything himself and to remain master of the situation 
but on the contrary he had revealed everything and he did not discover this until it was too late to retrieve his blunder how the marquis de valorset has kept his head above water is a wonder to me he continued his creditors have been threatening to sue him for more than six months how he has been able to keep them quiet since m de chaluse's death i cannot understand however this much is certain mademoiselle the marquis has not renounced his intention of becoming your husband and to attain that object he won't hesitate to employ any means that may promise to prove effectual completely mistress of herself mademoiselle marguerite listened with an impassive face i know all this she replied in a frigid tone what you know yes but there is one thing that baffles my powers of comprehension my dowry was the only temptation to m de valorsay was it not why does he still wish to marry me now that i have no fortune m fortunat had gradually lost all his advantage i have asked myself the same question he replied and i think i have found an answer i believe that the marquis has in his possession a letter or a will or a document of some sort written by m de chalus in fact an instrument in which the count acknowledges you as his daughter and which consequently establishes your right to his property and the marquis could urge this claim if he became my husband certainly he could m fortunat explained m de valorsay's conduct exactly as the old magistrate had done however mademoiselle marguerite discreetly refrained from committing herself the great interest that m fortunat seemed to take in her affairs aroused her distrust and she decided to do what he had attempted in vain that is allow him to do all the talking and to conceal all that she knew herself perhaps you are right she remarked but it is necessary to prove the truth of your assertion i can prove that valorsay hasn't a shilling and that he has lived for a year by expedients which render him liable to arrest and prosecution at any time i can prove that he deceived m de chalus as to his financial position i can prove that he conspired with m de corral to ruin your lover wouldn't this be something she smiled in a way that was exceedingly irritating to his vanity and in a tone of good-natured incredulity she remarked it is easy to say these things and to do them rejoined m fortunat quickly i never promise what i cannot perform a man should never touch a pen when he is meditating any evil act of course no one is fool enough to write down his infamy in detail but a man cannot always be on the qui vive there will be a word in one letter a sentence in another an allusion in a third and by combining these words phrases and allusions one may finally discover the truth he suddenly checked himself warned of his fresh imprudence by the expression on mademoiselle marguerite's face she drew back and looking him full in the eyes she exclaimed then you have been in m de valorsay's confidence sir would you be willing to swear that you never helped him in his designs a silent and ignored witness of this scene victor chupin was secretly delighted hit he thought hit just in the bull's-eye zounds there's a woman for you she has beaten the governor on every point m fortunat was so taken by surprise that he made no attempt to deny his guilt i confess that i acted as m de valorsay's adviser for some time he replied and he frequently spoke to me of his intention of marrying a rich wife in order to retrieve his shattered fortunes upon my word i see nothing so very bad about that it is not a strictly honest proceeding perhaps but it is done every day what is marriage in this age merely a business transaction is it not perhaps it would be more correct to say that it is a transaction in which one person tries to cheat the other the fathers-in-law are deceived or the husband or the wife and sometimes all of them together but when i discovered this scheme for ruining m ferrailleur i cried halt my conscience revolted at that dishonour an innocent man it was base cowardly outrageous and not being able to prevent this infamous act i swore that i would avenge it would mademoiselle marguerite accept this explanation chupin feared so and accordingly turning quickly to his employer he remarked 
to say nothing of the fact that this fine gentleman has swindled you outrageously shrewd as you are cheating you out of the forty thousand francs you lent him and which he was to pay you eighty thousand for m fortunat cast a withering look at his clerk but the mischief was done denial was useless he seemed fated to blunder in this affair well yes he declared it's true velocet has defrauded me and i have sworn to have my revenge i won't rest until i see him ruined mademoiselle marguerite was partially reassured for she understood his zeal now her scorn for the man was only increased but she was convinced that he would serve her faithfully i like this much better said she it is better to have no concealment you desire m de valorcet's ruin i desire the rehabilitation of m ferrailleur so our interests are in common but before acting in this matter we must know m ferrailleur's wishes they cannot be considered and why because no one knows what has become of him when the desire for revenge first took possession of me i at once thought of him i procured his address and went to the rue d'ulme but he had gone away the very day after his misfortune m ferrailleur sold his furniture and went away with his mother i am aware of that and i have come to ask you to search for him to discover his hiding-place will be only child's play to you do you suppose i haven't thought of this replied m fortunat why i spent all day yesterday searching for him by questioning the people in the neighbourhood i finally succeeded in ascertaining that madame ferrailleur left her home in a cab several hours after her son and took a very large quantity of baggage with her well do you know where she drove to the western railway station i am sure of this and i know she told a porter there that her destination was london m ferrailleur is now en route for america and we shall never hear of him again mademoiselle marguerite shook her head you are mistaken sir said she there can be no mistake about what i have just told you i don't question the result of your investigations but appearances are deceitful i thoroughly understand m ferrailleur's character and he is not the man to be crushed by an infamous calumny he may seem to fly he may disappear he may conceal himself for a time but it is only to make his vengeance more certain what pascal who is energy itself who possesses an iron will and invincible determination would he renounce his honour his future and the woman he loves without a struggle if he had felt that his case was hopeless he would have destroyed himself and as he has not done so he is not without hope he has not left paris i am sure of it m fortunat was not convinced in his opinion this was only sentiment and rubbish still there was one person present who was deeply impressed by the confidence of this young girl who was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen and whose devotion and energy filled his heart with admiration and this person was chupin he stepped forward with his eyes sparkling with enthusiasm and in a feeling voice he exclaimed i understand your idea yes m ferrailleur is in paris and i shall be unworthy of the name of chupin if i don't find him for you in less than a fortnight End of chapter eleven